thanks so much, James, for uh, jumping on this YouTube video. Uh, if you wouldn't mind taking a little bit and telling people what you did before you arrived at Microsoft. Okay. Well, I can sort out my COBOL days, but that's <laughs> too much of a history of being in the industry 35 years now, I would say. And throughout my career, a brief summary was I was sort of as a developer, then went into being a developer everywhere, working from government companies to small companies, medium-sized, large companies, Microsoft partners. I did consulting for a number of years. I ran my own fantasy football website. I had software that tracked all the leagues. I did that for a number of years. I was a DBA for many years. Oh, yeah. And and so just ran the gamut, gamut work, living in uh, New York to Las Vegas to Houston and now back to New York. Five years ago, I came to Microsoft and as a data and AI in the global Vaxbelt team, which was called Incubation at the time for analytics platform system, yeah. which was called PDW at the time. And then into a CSA role in the New York metro area for data and AI. And then last December to the MTC, the Microsoft Technology Center okay. in New York City as an architect. Oh, excellent. Well, and one of the things I like about you, James, other than you're just a generally nice guy and a smart guy, is that <laughs> you share the information. You don't just, it's just not in your head, and you disseminate it out to people through emails and through blogs. And so if this works right, I just wanted to make sure people knew how to find your information. So is this the right URL, jamesarah.com, best place to go? That is correct, James Sarah. Good. Excellent. So once again, I'll just, you know, put in my little uh, marketing for you. Really like your blog. Very helpful information. Goes deep. And it's not just all you and your knowledge. You point out other blogs and things and other posts. And so it's, it's very thorough. As an example of that was this top modern data warehouse questions. I think it's 15 FAQs. Um, really good. I love the one about where should I clean my data? And that's not going to be mm -hmm. our topic today, but I think that's a great article because there are so many choices, you know, in the source yeah. system as you pull it out, uh, you know, in the data lake, uh, after the data lake, et cetera. So I really like that. Now, where do you like to go? What are your favorite, I don't know, yeah, blogs, podcasts, books? What do you like, James, to look at uh, for um, information regarding you know, data, data transformation, big data? Well, there's so many of them. I To give her a plug list of coats is using my okay. first source because our blogs are similar. I think it seems like our thought process is similar on mm. how technology fits in. The complexity with so many Microsoft products is understanding the use case of the products. And that's what I spend most of my time with customers is first making them aware of the products that we have and then which product do I use? I want to build a data warehouse. Exactly. Well, I can go over a dozen different products, so I have to ask them questions, get feedback, and then try to guide them in a certain direction based on their skill set and other things in there. And the a lot of my blog comes from common questions that I start seeing. Every few months, you'll start seeing these patterns of similar questions come into play, or it could be just trying to blog about some new product that Microsoft came out with. I blog a lot because I forget things, and I yeah. blog about it. I don't talk about it for a few months. I go back and read my blog. Know, exactly. my, my, my own it's personal so thing. Yeah. And it was frustrating when I first started out because I would, I was a consultant. I would find a solution. Mm -hmm. And then months later, same problem would come up. And I go, I can't remember what that solution was. And I said, let me just blog about these things. This way it's documented for a customer so to true. have. And then I remembered it. And frequently I have to go back and read my blogs to the point there, there were times so well, my process is to build a blog is I will go read other blogs. I'll just bang yeah. it. And, and there's a handful of blogs that I always go look at sites and I'll just find the latest information. Sometimes it's pinging the product groups internally mm -hmm. at Microsoft and getting some information or, or decks about it all. And a lot of the, my whole process is trying to explain things at a high level because that's the way I best understand yeah. things. Give me a nice pretty picture and then let me go into the details later. But I need a high level overview or so my thinking won't continue forward. So I will do a lot of research and try to simplify things and then put them in the blog because I know customers like to read the blog and that's how they find out information in there. But there are times when I said, oh, I got to 
blog about this particular subject and I start researching and I start building writing my blog and there are a couple of times when I was doing a query and finding other blogs and I found my blog <laughs> I didn't realize I had previously wrote about right. this product and and so I, I, that's kind of an interesting situation but there's so many good blogs out yeah. there and you just got to take the time to do a little bit of research maybe you bookmark top 10 blogs yeah and then I get uh, some weekly newsletters that'll have some of the best blog posts and I use them and I just want the time now to go and look at every blog like I used to so I I rely on some summations that come in and I just learn to filter information and find out the key part, pieces of information I need to read about. Excellent. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, so what the topic I wanted to touch on, you know, the big, big uh, high level topic is di modern data warehouse design. And it's, it's really when it's kind of MPP versus SMP. So massively parallel processing, of course, you know, versus SMP, which is just regular old SQL server. And quite often when people think, hey, I want a data warehouse, Microsoft actually has a product called Data Warehouse, but you gotta be careful, as you know, because that's MPP. That's the old parallel data warehouse, massively parallel. Do you need that or not? So when customers are thinking about moving maybe to the cloud, modernizing their data warehouse, how do you help them in the conversations about that kind of massively parallel processing? Do they need that versus regular? And then I have a follow-up question on that. But Sure, and that's how I started out my world with the PDW, which was on-prem MPP, and now that we have this SQL data warehouse in there. And I make it important for customers to understand the differences between the two. It's not, between that SMP, it's not huge, but there are some noticeable differences, in particular when it comes to how the data is laid out in MPP. So there's some trade-offs because you have to learn how that's done, and if you don't do it right, you could have some very bad performance performance on there. But it's not much to, to, to understand and do a little bit of training on, on a day's worth and figure it all out. When it comes to when they should use that, it's not just that I have big data. I go and ask, well, how long are your queries taking and is that acceptable? And if I've had companies say, well, it takes two hours, but that's fine. I, we just run them at night. To others, it says it takes 20 seconds and that's taking too long in there. And so as a DBA, I've, I've known you there's a lot you can do to speed up queries. And instead of going and investing in some MPP solution, have you got the most out of your current hardware and the current model design? And at some point, it becomes too much. And I've seen companies do some very creative things to try to get the most out of SMP solution with multiple SQL servers and doing their own sharding. But it, at some point, it gets very complicated. And... When they decide that the queries are running too slow, however that is, then they start. I start mentioning MPP solutions in there, and and it's not so much the size of the data. We have these various levels at Microsoft. We'd say over this amount or this amount, but I really get back to how long your queries are taken and the complexity of the data. Now, I also have a caveat: is maybe you're getting acceptable performance now, but what's it going to be like three months, six months, twelve months now? Because the idea is building a modern data warehouse. You want to incorporate all the sorts of data, no matter the size or the speed of the type. And if you start adding more data, can the queries perform to the level you need? Because the whole point is getting better business answers to questions you have with the data, is mining that data and making better business decisions. And you're going to do that with the better business decisions with better and better data in there. So build something up front that can handle all that data and then you're going to wind up in a much better position than having to try to go retrofit everything afterwards. Excellent. Thank you, James. So let's say they've made that decision. They decide they do need the performance of MPP. And so just, just for an example, they bring the data into a data lake. They load it into this MPP system. Now they also have the need for executive level dashboards super quick. Uh, they, they can't wait the 20 seconds, the two minutes for some massive petabyte scale analytical query. They want the really lightning fast reports. What approaches have you seen people um, take as far as satisfying that need in, in the BI space? Yeah, and that's a great point to bring up because I've heard arguments that we don't need cubes anymore because we have these M these highly powerful SMP or MPP solutions in there, but I I think that's wrong 
thinking because in many cases you still need that tabular model, that cube. And the reason is performance is one of them. Also to build a semantic layer on there. The idea is if I have a really fast MPP product and I run a query on a billion rows and it takes five seconds, oh my God, that's great. Well, that's great unless you're on a dashboard and you're slicing and dicing and you can't wait five seconds. Exactly. And as much as you can tune that query, you may not get it under a few seconds in there. You may still, but you may want millisecond response time. And that's what a cube is. Essentially, it's an aggregation. It's a select statement on a value that's already been summed up. And you just can't get any faster than that. And you'll run queries be extremely fast on there. So when customers, I asked them, one of the first things is, what, what are you going to be reporting on? How are you going to do the reporting? And if they start saying, we're going to have dashboards, and we're going to have hundreds or thousands of users, that's an indicator to me is you may want to have a tabular model using an urgent analysis services or SSAS to, for those dashboards in there to get the millisecond response, to get the semantic layer. Also, you start getting things like hierarchies and KPIs and, and these financial time calculations are all built into this cube or tabular model that you don't have in, in the MVP solution. And the other thing that th that's important is no matter which product you use, they're going to have some concurrency limit when it gets to the MPP solutions. In SQL Data Warehouse, it's 128. We're, we're going to up that, but even if it was 500, each dashboard could have a dozen or so queries behind it. And if you have hundreds of users, it's going to quickly overwhelm that SQL Data Warehouse. So now we start getting all interesting solutions you can make. You, can, you, you still many times want to have the SQL Data Warehouse because that'll be processing the cube, and that'll go a lot faster with an MPP solution. Plus, you're going to still probably have ad hoc queries or operational type of reports that would go against the SQL data warehouse, and you just leave the, the cube for the dashboards type. So a lot of times, and this is where we get into complexity of a modern data warehouse, is you can have multiple copies of the data and more complexity, more ETL, more cost. But as you go down the line of having additional copies, the data gets transformed in a way that's more easy to be consumable by different types of people, whether that be somebody in the dashboard or whether it be some regular user on queries or a, a data scientist or a power user. Th th you have the best of both worlds. I can put it in a data lake and I can quickly access the data without having to get IT involved in there, but I have to do more work when I pull it out to just get it to this cube where I can go to Power BI and I just click and drag the field and create the reports. I don't have to do or know anything about the data behind the scenes. And, and so th that's where you get the complexity. There's, there's, I, I, sometimes I miss the old days where everything's a mainframe, you just dump it all in there. I agree. Yep. But, but, and now you're creating something more complex. Right. But the end result is you can handle any type of data and make any end user happy with a solution that has a little bit, some more components to it. Yeah, that's excellent. So you mentioned Cube, so that could be done via SSAS on a VM, let's say, in Azure, or you ma mentioned Azure Analysis Services, which is our cloud offering, currently supports the tabular model, right? Um, yeah. Okay. Well, that's great input and great guidance. And anything else you want to leave off with? Otherwise, I think, man, I think this will be great for to help people out there as they uh, think about designing a modern data warehouse. Anything yeah, the one point I'll, I'll bring up is you, we have Azure Analysis Services and we have Power BI, which sort of has Azure Analysis Services built into it. So I'm starting to see companies that say, well, do I need Azure Analysis Services? Because what's happening is Power BI is even adding more features than what's in AAS. So I think in the future, maybe analysis, Azure Analysis Services will be completely engulfed in Power BI and you'll do everything through that way, especially with XML endpoints where you can go and, and access the, the cube that sits in there. And so that could be a way you can not have to use Azure Analysis Services, but just use the power of what's in Power BI. I can't believe I said that. But it, and that's the, the thing I always caution is yes, but make sure the solution you're building is an enterprise solution. Because if I have somebody using Power BI and now with it having data flows in there, I can use that tool for everything for pulling the data from a source, for cleaning it, for putting it in a storage, for then reporting off of it and using a, a tabular model on the back end. But if I'm building that, it's, it's 
self-service ETL, it's, it's really just for one or a handful of people. It's not really an enterprise solution. So I have to, have to talk to customers about when do you want to have more enterprise-wide products like Azure Data Factory or Azure Now services in there. We're making it so you can kind of transition from one to the other. Maybe an end user helps you by building out something in Power BI and you take it from there and expand it and make it to an enterprise one. But you have to think through those things and that's where it gets the complexity of which product to uh, to choose. And a lot of times it becomes, are you building an enterprise solution or one, or something for an individual? Yeah, it's awesome. Great point, James. And I'll point people back to that same uh, blog. You had a great, um, one of the 15 questions was about um, ETL and you mentioned Azure Data Factory with the new data flows and how that's really kind of code free um, ETL, but Deep down, it's creating like Scala code. It's running on Databricks. It's Spark. I mean, yeah. so which is just really kind of mind blowing that you can get that kind of performance without really slinging code. So, great yeah. points. And uh, well, James, thanks so much for your time today. I appreciate your your wisdom. Yeah, glad to be here. This, I love talking, having, having these conversations. I, I I'm fortunate in my role, I get to talk with customers every day about this kind of stuff in there. But because we have so many products and so many use cases, that's why they have us as solution architects to help clients understand these products and how best to use them. Because the last thing I want to have happen is somebody build a solution and go, your products are terrible. Well, it wasn't the products were bad, as you wow. use them for the wrong use case. Exactly. And that's what we need to do as architects is help customers better understand the proper use case for these products so they choose the right ones to build their enterprise solution. Yeah, excellent. Okay, well, thanks so much, James. Thank you for having me. Okay, bye-bye.